So welcome again to IIT Bombay and of course those of you who are from IIT Bombay already welcome to just the growth meeting all of you. Uh, this is the growth winter con uh, school and it is going to be followed by a conference right after the school is over. Uh, this event is a part of the international growth collaboration. So what is growth? Uh, we thought that we need to give people a run for their money as far as convoluted acronyms go. So uh, growth stands for global relay of observatories watching transients happen. Uh, one point to anyone who memorizes that right away. Uh, it's an international collaboration. We have people from eight countries and I think uh, about 15 institutes now. Uh, Professor Mansi Kasliwal here is the PI. She will be telling you more about it soon. Uh, selection for this winter school itself was extremely competitive. So uh, uh, we, we selected something about 15% of all the people who applied. So great, you have made it here and selection was made on the basis of people who are most likely to benefit from this school which means you have to have a good background and you have to be able to use all of this because this is an advanced school. Okay, so what we are going to be doing here over the course of three days is uh, we will take you through a series of modules all hands on. You have hopefully been to at least one of the help desk sessions that were held yesterday and day before so that you have your laptops configured. Anyone who had any issue running any of the modules uh, make sure you are sitting next to someone whose laptop has been configured and tested. Okay, despite all of our efforts, uh, we could not get all laptops running fine. Uh, we have a lot of tutors here who are going to help you with uh, anything that you might get stuck with. So can I request all tutors to please stand up and raise their hands? Uh, hands up. Okay, so these are all the people. Uh, all of them are wearing green badges. So if you are stuck with anything, uh, within the school or if you are stuck with uh, finding your way around IIT Bombay, then find someone with a green badge and they will help you. Um, also please keep your own badges on, we like to know who we are talking to and uh, the food guy likes to make sure that they are giving food to people who need that food, so anyone with the badges, okay. Uh, I think food is a higher motivation for keeping your badges on than anything else. Um, and then the, we have emailed a schedule to you uh, yesterday. We, the first two days are extremely packed. We have four, uh, uh, you know, tutorials every day. And after the four tutorials are done, we will also have a remote observing session. So I'll say a little bit about Growth India first. And uh, once that is done, uh, I will hand over the floor to Mansi. So Growth India is, as the name suggests, the Indian component of the growth collaboration. So this is a partnership between the Indian Institute of Technology Bombay and the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore. Okay, and together we have set up a 0.7 meter telescope in Ladakh. We had first light in June. You can see all of these pretty images that have been put around were all taken from the Grote telescope. There are a few images outside. And uh, of course, what's astronomy without pretty pictures, right? Uh, but we are going to go beyond the pretty picture stage. Of course, you will be learning how to use the growth telescope and how to actually analyze data from that. So both tonight and tomorrow night we will actually have remote observing sessions. Uh, the telescope is being built to be India's first fully robotic telescope. So the idea is that at sunset um, the dome opens by itself, the telescope takes calibration observations by itself, goes through a, a pre-scheduled observing run. If there is any target of opportunity, if something blows up anywhere in the universe, that's what the growth collaboration is after. Uh, then we will have machine to machine alerts so that if it's 4 a.m., you know, my computer won't wait for me to wake up, get, be awake enough, type in the wrong coordinates, then realize I have typed them wrong, uh, then type in the right coordinates. All of that is too slow. So we want to make sure that uh, we are doing things fast and on time. So the telescope will respond automatically, right? We are not fully there yet with the telescope. We hope to be there in a month or two from now. But uh, as of now, you will be able to use these telescopes remotely, okay? So um, that, is, that is all. If you need anything with, uh, hopefully you are all comfortable uh, in your accommodations. Uh, all of your meals right now will be here. Your breakfasts are arranged at wherever you are staying. And if you have any questions about anything, then uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, Two very important announcements before I close. First is that everyone, if you are in front of the camera, make sure you smile. This is being telecast live over the world. Uh, all of this is also being recorded and will remain online forever. So uh, no cat videos, please. Okay. Uh, 
and announcement number two is that uh, this this is a uh, part of a large international effort and we want to make sure that we quantify how well we are doing so we'll all receive links for a feedback form and uh, we have some time allotted on the last day uh, please do take note of anything that you like anything that you dislike uh, whose jokes are the most funny whose are the most lame or whatever uh, and do fill all of that in the feedback form we need to know what we can change to make these events better and better so with that i welcome professor mansi kasliwal pi of growth uh, for talking about the workshop a bit more all right good morning everyone so my name is mansi um a few decades ago i was born right here in bombay so this is where, where my very own personal journey began so it gives me extra pleasure extra special pleasure in welcoming all of you to the growth winter school the very first growth winter school uh this is the first in a series of schools that we hope to do over the next few years right here at iit bombay um so uh, right now the times that we live in are super exciting we are quite literally watching the birth of something called multi messenger astrophysics okay so i'm going to break this word into a few pieces for you and the goal of the next 30 minutes is just to ensure that you're motivated excited and work really really hard over the next 3 days to learn as much as you can um from uh, the growth winter school so uh why is this so much fun right so you can see the first date there is 2015 september 14th this was a few days before the very first and uh, observing run of the advanced ligo interferometer and even before they started uh, they detected their very first gravitational wave and this very first gravitational wave just lasted for a couple of seconds and it was two 30 solar mass black holes merging we didn't even know 30 solar mass black holes exist let alone that they merge and form something that is over 60 solar masses and it was absolutely incredible incredible that three solar masses of that got converted into energy um and this is one of the most amazing events we've seen this is what the nobel prize in physics was given for but last year in 2017 there was that okay on august 17 2017 there was the longest so about 100 seconds loudest so signal to noise of 32 and closest gravitational wave signal we've ever heard and this looked very different from all the black hole black hole mergers that the nobel prize was given for right and this here is is to me even more amazing than black holes merging because this was two neutron stars neutron stars merging So black holes are cool, they're fun, right? But they're very black. There's no light associated with them. And what was amazing about this event was that there was light. It lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum from the gamma rays all the way to the radio, okay? So uh so the electromagnetic spectrum, just to remind you, spans um 16 orders of magnitude depending on whether you look at the frequency, the wavelength, um the size scale, the temperature, um this is a very very um rich um set of physics that you can extract if you're well versed fluent in understanding um a, a data from across the entire electromagnetic spectrum so the goal of the growth winter school is to give you a taste of of data from all of these different wave bands and give you a first set of tools to make sense of that data so that you can get to the heart of the astrophysics not just with one piece of the puzzle but with all the pieces of the puzzle so that you can make a concordant picture of what is actually happening when there is an explosion there is a cosmic firework in the night sky and this field is even richer because there's not just one discovery engine if you talk about gravitational wave interferometers um there are already three gravitational wave interferometers one in hanford one in louisiana uh this is in north america one in italy and right here in india fourth interferometer is being built and in japan there's yet another one which is underground fully cryogenic and underground that's being built uh neutrinos and ultra high energy cosmic rays is was the very first taste of multi messenger we ever had uh decades ago when we saw neutrinos from the sun neutrinos from the supernova 1987a um and on the electromagnetic side there's a whole bunch of acronyms this is your homework go google each one of these and figure out what all these different acronyms stand for The point is there are many many different facilities many many different surveys that are undertaking celestial cinematography they are making movies of the sky 
night after night or minute after minute, hour after hour to understand and characterize what the dynamic universe is like. So you go out there and you look and you see, okay, the stars look just about the same. It's actually really not the same. Every second in the universe, is a, there's a new supernova, which actually is a billion times brighter than the sun. You just have to look in the right place. Um, and so far, this, this uh, slide was sort of devoid of um, wide field infrared and ultraviolet Im imaging. But I'm optimistic that that is coming soon as well. When I say wide field, I mean something that's at least a square degree in size, right? So can somebody tell me how wide the full moon is on the sky? Right, so uh, a square degree is not much. So that's my definition of wide field. But there is hope, even in these two wave bands that have been overlooked and people haven't paid enough attention to. And I encourage you to talk to Kishale Day here um, for a brand new telescope uh, that is part of his PhD thesis. He's a graduate student at Caltech. Um, a robotic infrared telescope with a 25 square degree camera that he's in the midst of commissioning um, to open up that wave band to see what fireworks exist. But discovery engines are just step one, right? To get to the heart of the astrophysics, you need to know more than here's a point in the sky that did not exist before. You need to actually characterize it across the electromagnetic spectrum, get data from many, many different wavelengths with many, many different telescopes to understand the phenomena. And in the central part of the electromagnetic spectrum, in the optical and the infrared in particular, there's a fundamental limitation. There's a big spoil spot in the room, and that is the sun. Okay, our very own, our very beloved sun. Once the sun rises, the telescopes can't observe. Um, and what the growth network that uh, uh, is organizing this winter school for you does is overcome that challenge by making friends with people around the world. So say we discover a new transient in California at Palomar Observatory, um, and the sun rises, so you have to stop collecting data. You just move west to Hawaii, then to Japan, Taiwan, India, Israel, etc so that you have a ring of telescopes that are longitudinally distributed so you can continue to collect data because it's dark somewhere at some time, right? So even though many of us in the room right now are jet lagged, jet lag can have its benefits, okay? So it's, it's actually an advantage that the team never sleeps. Um, so this is a set of 16 growth co-investigators around the world, uh, but I'll tell you a secret. The real powerhouse of growth are the students and postdocs. So that's why the winter school is especially important to me um, because the, the young people in the collaboration is where all the action, all the discoveries are, are truly happening. Um, so the growth collaboration over the la has been active for the last three years. We've just begun our fourth year. And you can see that the rate at which we write papers, this is not cumulative. This is individual in every year. We were initially writing you know, a little over a paper a month. Um, now we're writing uh, nearly, nearly a paper a week. Uh, we're getting to that stage. And uh, more than half of these papers are led by, uh, by students and postdocs in the collaboration. And that gives me immense pride here. So I can't tell you about all 84 papers in the next few minutes. So I'm going to just give you, give you some highlights to just give you a taste of what sort of science can be done with such a fantastic network of people, not just telescopes. So I'm going to begin with this uh, event. Um, so that you don't uh, think that everything that, that happens or that you learn in the winter school just somehow was just a lot of luck that happened on one day in August, on August 17th. Um, the growth collaboration and many collaborations around the world have been looking for electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational waves and preparing for this search for many, many years. In fact, even in the first observing run, even before the first observing run of advanced LIGO, there was enhanced LIGO uh, where triggers were being sent out. Some of them were not even um, were real. And people were looking in those large error boxes um, to look for real astrophysical signal that could, could potentially be associated with that gravitational wave event. So on January 4th, so note that this is several months before August 17th of 2017, two black holes merged. And the Atlas survey reported this very rapidly declining transient in the error circle. So it was spatially coincident with um, that gravitational wave event. So we all got excited. It was snowing at Palomar. But we triggered whatever telescopes we could, where there's different in different parts. It's another advantage of a network. And we started to collect data and, um, and make this light curve. And that's when Professor Bhale Rao noticed that if you fit this light curve, then the zero, the T0 in this light curve, is not at zero, but it's offset 
by 21 hours, right? Okay, first of all, there should be no light from black hole, black hole mergers. Okay, there's some crazy models for that, but doesn't, I don't know, I mean, they're a little speculative. But 21 hours later, there was in fact a gamma ray burst in the same part of the sky. Uh, and that's what the signal was all about, okay? So the details here are very, very important. And in a couple of modules, um, you'll see on the last day, um, you're getting a taste of science that has nothing to do with gravitational waves. You'll get a taste of asteroid science, light curve science, um, or light curves of uh, variable stars. Um, and this sort of science is important because to do the multi-messenger science that, that many of you are interested in, you really need to understand the many facets of time domain astronomy so that you know when something is truly physically associated with the signal that you're after. Okay, so let me take the next uh, 20 minutes here um, to tell you about this um, fascinating, absolutely uh, mind-blowing event that occurred on August 17, 2017. So on August 17, 2017, at about 1241 UTC, you heard the blip that all the excitement was about. Two neutron stars merged. And about 1.7 seconds later, there was a burst of gamma rays. Um, and I'm very, very carefully calling this a burst of gamma rays and not a gamma ray burst, okay? I choose my words very carefully. I'll come back to this point. Um, so you see this, this very short burst of gamma rays here seen by the Fermi telescope and the integral telescope. It's actually a hard spike with a little bit of a soft tail. Um, hard and soft is refers to the energy of the photons here. It's delayed by about two seconds from the merger of the gravitational waves. And there's a very good reason why, and we'll come back to that point as well. But this meant that there was light for the very first time at the highest end of the electromagnetic spectrum, the most energetic part of the electromagnetic spectrum that seemed to be spatially and uh, temporarily coincident with the gravitational waves. So this set of, uh, I think over 3,000 astronomers worldwide to point every telescope they possibly could to try to understand where in the sky this event happened. So the localization on sky is very, very poor from gravitational waves and gamma rays. But inside this localization, in this particular case, there were only 49 galaxies. And the game was find out which particular, which galaxy and which point in the galaxy did that neutron star, neutron star merger actually happen. So if you're interested in this sort of a hunt, of finding the home of the, the merger, pay extra attention to the next session where Leo Singer is going to tell you about how you take um, these different localizations, how do you cross match that to a galaxy catalog, how do you rank order those galaxies, which one to search first. In this case, Leo and Dave Cook managed to get the galaxies ordered in a way such that the third galaxy on the list, the third most massive galaxy on their list, was the true home of the merger. So they didn't even have to march down to galaxy number 49. Um, you know, three was enough. Um, so pay ex extra attention to that module there. And this red dot in this galaxy, NGC 4993, was the localized electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave merger event on August 17, 2017. Now, several students at IIT Bombay working with Varun made this cool video to try to capture the excitement of what was happening as the Earth was rotating and different telescopes were observing and collecting data. Pavan is smiling, I guess. Yeah, that's full credit to him right there. Um, raise your hand. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a beautiful video where as time el elapses, um, different telescopes light up uh, as they collect data. And you'll see some are in red and some are in green. And Pavan was very careful about that too, because um, if you look at the radio telescopes, they can observe you know, night or day. The optical and infrared telescopes are the ones that are a little bit more constrained. And there were a total of 70 telescopes that collected data on this gravitational wave event. It was incredible. And it was in all seven continents, including one point, I think, from this telescope in, in Antarctica. And there were seven telescopes in space as well. Absolutely incredible. Um, and in order to understand how you collect data, see if somebody tells you something amazing has happened in this point of the sky, how do you go about collecting data? Pay attention to session three, where Professor Robert Quimby and Shubham, who's the project scientist for Growth India, are going to tell you more about how you prepare for an observing run, how do you actually go about collecting data, figuring out which targets are visible, um, what's the best way in which to collect the data that you need um, to go to the next step of data analysis. 
All right, so what do we learn? Data collection is great. We have lots of data. But what do we learn, right? What, what are the questions we're able to fundamentally answer? Okay, so I'm going to give you a flavor of two questions right now. The first question is nucleosynthesis. The Earth is a really beautiful place. The periodic table is so incredibly rich. But the embarrassing fact is that a year and a half ago, we didn't know where half the elements in the periodic table, heavier than iron, were synthesized. So we knew that hydrogen and helium came from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. All the stuff shown in blue, we knew it comes from supernovae, no question. All the stuff shown in yellow, it was just a theory from 1974 where Latimer and Schramm said, okay, this should come from neutron star mergers. But we had zero data or evidence for this fact. And what this event gave us for the very first time was watching two neutron stars in action, identifying the electromagnetic counterpart and seeing is believing, actually testing this hypothesis of where all these elements in the periodic table actually come from. So this data that was collected from um, all these 70 telescopes, um, if you just look at the UV, optical and infrared, uh, this is just a, a subset of the data. You can read all these papers to get all the data that was collected. Um, how do you convert that to what is called a light curve, which is how bright is the event as a function of time? Right? You can see the UV light is just dropping in a couple of days. Um, the optical is around for maybe a week. The infrared for several, several weeks. So this thing is very, very red. You can see that right up front. But it takes a lot of effort, a lot of hard work to even put one point on this light curve. So please learn how to do this correctly um, in the uh, sessions 5, 6, and 7, where you learn how to do image subtraction, how to do photometry, how do you actually get these points on the light curve? And there's several people who work very hard to get these modules um, ready for you. Uh, but no matter what telescope you're working with and, and what sort of data you're collecting, these steps will be um, what you need to go through to, to be able to put one point on this, on this light curve. And after you put this one, one point on the light curve, you sort of have to combine it to a physical quantity. right? These are just different filters, like light as a function of time. So talk to Christopher Fremling here, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, on how do you combine this data to a physical quantity. Now you want something in ergs per second. Now if there's some engineers, they actually want it in joules per second or something, but sorry, astronomers work in CGS units. So only CGS units for the next three days. But how do you actually sum all of that light to get bolometric luminosity as a function of time, okay? So this is now a sum of all that light, a clever sum to get luminosity as a function of time, Temperature is a function of time, radius is a function of time, velocity is a function of time. Now you're starting to get to the heart of the astrophysics. If you look at this plot, this is what's telling you now that heavy elements are being synthesized. What's actually powering the emission here is this dotted blue line, which is radioactive decay of heavy elements. There's still a puzzle. There's too much light in, in the first few days, but we'll come back to that. Another completely independent um, diagnostic is what is the spectrum doing? So spectrum is taking the light and not just taking a camera and imaging it, but also putting it through a prism or any sort of, sort of dispersing element and splitting the light into its components. So now you're looking at flux density as a function of the wavelength. Um, this here is just one spectrum that was taken by the, with the Gemini South Telescope. And you can see it has these two very, very broad features. So gray is the data. Black is just the smooth data, and red is not a model fit. It's a pre-existing model from uh, five years ago now, uh, uh, done by Professor Dan Kaysen and Dr. Jennifer Barnes, um, where they looked at what the sum of the radioactive decay could, would look like spectroscopically. And just overplotting the data, not even trying to fit the data, actually is not, not a terrible fit at all. So this is the thumbprint of, of heavy elements uh, synthesis here. And you'll have growth uh, school session eight, where Professor Robert Quimby from San Diego will tell you all about how do you go about the process of spectroscopy and understanding, making sense of this data, uh, reducing this data, and identifying elements in this data. Um, in the case of GW170817, there was a, an exquisite series of data, spectroscopic data that was taken across the UVOIR band path here. Um, and you can see as time evolves, something very, very hot and blue, very quickly became very, very red and, and sustained, there was sustained red emission. There's a lot of debate right now in the community on what these bumps and wiggles actually are, right? 
There are 100, between atomic mass number 70 and 200, there are 130 elements. So the question is, okay, I think everybody's agreed that heavy elements were synthesized, but exactly which elements were synthesized? Was there a lot of neodymium, maybe some cesium, maybe some tellurium? There's a lot of debate, but I think people will be hard at work trying to identify elements and make sense of this um, for some time to come. So heavy elements were synthesized, but whether or not um, the production rate of heavy elements is such that it can explain the solar abundance, can explain all the elements we see around us. I think that is very much an open question. A quick back of the envelope calculation tells you that something like 0.05 solar masses of heavy elements were synthesized. This is 10,000 times the mass of the Earth. This is a lot of heavy elements, right? And if you multiply that by the rate at which, at which neutron star mergers happen, it's of the order of 500 per gigaparsec cube per year with a factor of two uncertainty in both directions. That checks out. That is consistent with the observed solar abundance. But I, I don't think that is by any means hard evidence that it is the site um, instead of a site of heavy element production here. And then there's this question of um, if you look at the solar abundance, most of the material actually is in, is in the low atomic mass numbers. The heaviest elements like gold and platinum um, are actually a very small fraction of the total mass budget of elements in the solar neighborhood. And there's some tantalizing evidence now with the Spitzer Space Telescope um, to, to suggest that, in fact, even those extremely heavy elements were synthesized. So let's move on to a completely different question um, to give you yet another flavor of what sort of science you can extract from multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, and this is the question of the jet physics. So this question of whether I should call this thing, this burst of gamma rays, a gamma ray burst or not. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's slice and dice that question in, in some more detail. And if you're interested in relativistic jets um, and understanding this sort of physics, pay extra attention to the X-ray and radio components of the growth uh, uh, winter school. Um, and these have been put together by uh, Dipankar Bhattacharya, Devita Sarogi, Poonam Chandra, and David Kaplan. Um, so please, please pay extra attention to the two extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the highest energies and the lowest energies, because that's where most of the key information for jet physics comes from. So why this, why this uh, semantics question, right? So um, in the case of GW170817, there was this burst of gamma rays, but it was delayed by, by a couple of seconds. And it was intrinsically very, very weak. Um, so given that we know the distance to the galaxy, which is 40 megaparsec, this burst of gamma rays was very, very wimpy. It was 10,000 times weaker than any other gamma ray burst we had seen before. So I'm not just talking about a few percent effect, but a factor of 10,000 effect. Now this is so weak that a traditional gamma ray burst model, the burst is just not even able to break out. So there's no way that Earth could be in the line of sight or looking down the barrel of the jet here. Okay, so that very quickly everybody agreed on that you could not be looking down the barrel of the jet. This is not an on-axis gamma ray burst. So what people suggested, for suggestion, was that you were just slightly off-axis. So Earth was misaligned by the direction in which the jet came from by just a few degrees. Now, um, the drop in gamma ray emission as you go off-axis goes as 1 over delta theta to the fourth power. So you only need to be 0.1 radian off-axis to be 10 to the 4 times weaker, right? So, so 0.1 radian is not a lot, it's only, only a few degrees. Um, so the Earth would have to be slightly off axis to explain this weaker gamma ray emission. Now the conundrum was that uh, we had data at other wavelengths as well, the radio and the X-ray, and there was no emission there for 9 days in the X-rays and 12 days in the radio. It took a very, very long time for those two extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum to light up. And that means that if you look at this off-axis model, that places a very hard limit that you have to be very, very off-axis to see nothing at all from a gamma ray burst of this, um, uh, of the, which has these properties. So that would suggest the Earth is here. Now clearly, we live on only one planet Earth, right? We don't have friends on other planets yet with telescopes. So this is not possible. You cannot both be slightly off-axis and widely off-axis at the same time, right? So something is very wrong with this, with this simple model 
of an off-axis gamma ray burst. So, combining the clue that you have gamma rays that are weaker by a factor of 10,000 and radio and x-rays that are delayed by 9 days or more uh, is just inconsistent with traditional gamma ray burst models. And as I mentioned to you before, when, when putting together this light curve model, there was a third puzzle, which was that this event was much too bright and much too blue at early time. I think the infrared, theoretically, we were able to make sense of pretty quickly that it was powered by heavy element radioactive decay. But this bright blue early emission was a big puzzle. Okay? So people came up with different ideas of how do you put together these different uh, puzzles. And I'm going to give you one model that, um, uh, that we call the cocoon breakout. Okay? Let me explain what this is. And the idea is that um, when you have two neutron stars spiraling towards each other, coming closer and closer before merger, um, at that time they are ripping each other apart. Right? So the material, there's a lot of material, there's just a lot of stuff around the two neutron stars before, even before they merge. So when this ultra-relativistic jet gets launched, this jet gets launched into a very messy medium, right? It's not a clean, empty medium. So what could happen is that the, the launch of the jets, and you see the energetics on the, on the left and the kinematics on the right. Um, so as this jet gets launched, it starts to transfer energy to this material that's just lying around in the circumburst medium, right? So if the jet transfers energy into the surrounding medium, it forms this very wide angle um, set of material that is now moving not as fast as the jet, but moving at mildly relativistic speeds. So instead of um, Lorentz factors of 100, you're talking about Lorentz factors of a few. Now, Lorentz factors of a few is still 0.9 C, or point nine, I mean, it's just a question of how many nines you put after the C. So it's still extremely fast, right? So the word mild is only a relative term, but this very wide angle jet, or, uh, or actually this is what we call this thing as a cocoon, this very wide angle thing breaks out. And that is giving, gives you a very, very weak set of gamma rays. Um, so if something is very wide and relatively slower, that can explain why you have gamma rays that are 10,000 times weaker. There's no line of sight problem. You could be looking anywhere along this line of sight. It because things are slower, it explains why the radio and the x-rays are late. And possibly because things are getting accelerated, um, just by Doppler boosting, you can explain the bright blue early emission. It could also be explained by viewing angle effects. Um, but it's all very, very self-consistent. So it seems like this cocoon model is very good. It's a co nice concordant picture in explaining what um, all the emission across the electromagnetic spectrum actually looks like. But there was still one puzzle, which was what was the fate of the jet? So this jet transferred energy. It made this wide angle cocoon. But did the jet itself make its way out? Or did the jet completely get choked by this cocoon that it gave birth to? Right? And this was an open question um, for uh, several months, actually. Um, initially, we could just say that the emission that we are seeing was uh, coming from the cocoon. Um, but uh, in the radio wave bands, even though radio turned on the latest, it stayed bright for the longest. And in the radio wave bands, there's this beautiful compilation of radio data from many, many different telescopes around the world. Um, the radio emission ro kept rising for about 140 days and then turned over and then declined very steeply. And even the superluminal motion from radio interferometry was uh, very convincing that, um, compelling, or at least I would say, that even though there was a cocoon that was formed, a very narrow, very powerful jet did escape somewhere. Um, so if you had a friend on an alien civilization that was on axis, they would see a very peculiar burst of gamma rays from this ultra-relativistic narrow jet. So let me conclude with a movie of this picture. This is just a, a toy animation where you see the two neutron stars spiraling towards each other. You see, the, um, you see the material going around, the jet being launched, the cocoon being formed, the radioactive decay from these heavy elements, and then finally the interaction with the interstellar medium that gives you the radio and the X-ray emission. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here and hope you have a lot of fun in the next three days uh, learning about all the different facets of time domain astronomy. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Excellent question, right? So um, now the cocoon is moving at 0.9c instead of 0.9999c. So it's just because the material is moving slower, by the time it, re it takes longer to get to the intercellular medium and interact with. 
So that's why there's a delayed onset. But there's so much material that it, it, it leads to a very, very slow rise, right? And then finally, in that sharp decline at the end is where you start to see hints of the jet. That, that was very fast. Ga gamma rays you see straight away. But it takes 1.7 seconds, right? So straight away is also relative, right? Because there's a delay between the jet being launched, transferring all this material, and then the cocoon breaking out. It does. It makes it much weaker, right? That's why it's 10,000 times weaker. And it's a couple of seconds delayed. This here is energetics on the left half, and this here is, is kinematics, velocity. But I refer you to this Gottlieb et al. paper to, look, to learn more about the modeling and the, and the um, gamma ray modeling in particular. No, let me add, there's one other student who had a question. I'll, I'll take that one. So the source of the emission in the X-rays, the radio and gamma ray, we believe is this cocoon, right? So the cocoon, when it, when, it, when it just breaks out of the circumverse medium, you see a flash of gamma rays. When this cocoon travels, starts to interact with the interstellar medium, that interaction leads to, to the radio and um, X-ray emission. So, um, so when you have the radio emission that's powered by synchrotron, and then correspondingly to that, if you just go all the way up, you get inverse Compton emission. And I, I hope uh, in both session four and session 11 and 12, you learn more about the physics that goes on behind the radio and the X-ray um, part of the spectrum. So wait, wait for that. There's one more hand that I saw. Yes, back there. Yeah, so this is an image taken with the Gemini telescope of this galaxy. This is the third galaxy on, on Leo's list here. And when he took this image, um, what he did was he combined data in multiple different filters, right? And this emission at this time was very, very red. So there was bright blue emission at early time, but this bright blue emission disappeared, it faded away. But for the longest time, for about three weeks, there was sustained red emission. So if you combine this to make color images, just like you see Growth India, color images all over uh, the room, then the emission here from the electromagnetic counterpart was extremely, extremely red. And this dot, this, this point, just did not exist before August 17, 2017. It doesn't exist right now. It's long gone um, beyond detection limits of different telescopes. So this was a transient flash. This was something that was short-lived, but extremely energetic. So this was m millions of, um, I would say hundreds of millions of times brighter than the sun for this very short window of time in which we collected data and tried to study and characterize this point of emission. Great question, right? So um, the easy way is you just look at the waveform um, and you look at the length of the waveform, right? And if you look at the length of the waveform here, you'll see the length of the waveform is much, much longer, right? Because neutron stars are, are um, less dense than, than black holes. So that affects the, the duration of the spiral and the merger. But if you are very, very careful, what you really want to do is simulate extreme space time. You want to actually figure out what the, the general relativity model is, what are the equations that actually characterize this emission. This is how people are able to model waveforms. And people in the ligo virgo collaboration have a, have a template bank of waveforms, which when they very precisely match to these squiggles here onto the data that they collect from the gravitational waves, they're able, able to derive all of these different parameters about the waveform. So they're able to derive the masses of the individual elements that, that merge, uh, the mass ratios, you can see, I mean, some the some of the some, some things here are precise to the third point in the decimal place here. So just general relativity is an extremely powerful tool um, in telling you all of these different parameters about the system and characterizing the strong field gravity in the system. So you have to solve those equations of general relativity to extract that. Okay, so, uh, so. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions. We have three full days about gravitation and wave mergers and waveforms and everything, so you could ask those questions in the break. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Leo Singer from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and he is going to start with our first module, which is the Python Basics module. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, I'm going to uh, teach you some Python basics. Uh, raise your hand if you already know Python. Great, so that's a, a good majority of the room. Um, I'll also go through uh, a few pieces of the Python infrastructure that, uh, that I think are especially useful for astronomy. 
um, uh, namely in addition to NumPy and Matplotlib and SciPy, which uh, you use respectively for um, uh, sci you know, numerical computing, plotting, and uh, sort of scientific algorithms. Uh, also AstroPy, which is um, where you find a lot of the tools for reading and writing uh, various astronomy-specific data formats and um, uh, unit conversion, cosmology, so on and so forth. All right, so as I, as I said, um, so I assumed no Python uh, experience, but um, uh, so we'll go through Python basics, but I'll also uh, stop and call out matplotlib, numpy, scipy. Um, this, this tutorial is uh, in a Jupyter notebook. So uh, Jupyter is an environment that um, allows you to uh, mi mix um, uh, graphics and text and uh, and code and plots that that come out of that code and it works with it in a number of different languages um, but it was originally developed for Python and the best supported language right now is Python so this is a Jupyter notebook um, and lastly we'll uh, talk a little bit about AstroPy um, so um, the purest way of interacting with Python is through the command line interpreter so this is called um, a, a REPL, or R-E-P-L, stand, it stands for Read, Execute, Print, Loop. Uh, so, so this is the traditional way of interacting Python, and so by uh, working in the notebook is nice for uh, doing data analysis, but, uh, so, but very frequently when, when you want to take something that you've uh, done in the notebook and then um, make it reusable, you'll need, to, you'll need to learn how to write Python modules and work in, in the Python shell. Um, which is not something that I'll be covering. Um, so this is an example of what you can do with the notebook. So, so here I have um, uh, a few lines of code that uh, just plot a sinusoid. So this, this is some Python code. It uses NumPy and Matplotlib, and the output from the plot goes right here. Um, uh, so there's just one um, line that's, uh, that I wanted to call out here. That's this matplotlib inline command. That's not actually Python code, that's, that's an instruction to the Jupyter notebook, and that tells it that plots should go in line like this. And so um, if you're having trouble with uh, plots not showing up uh, in your notebook, uh, you want to make sure that you've run that command. Um, I, another neat feature um, is that uh, there are a number of different Python packages that um, uh, allow you to manipulate tabular data, so that you can use, uh, um, you know, you can have sort of a spreadsheet that's built into Python, and um, the AstroPy table module is one of those. Um, and here I've constructed a, a, a simple table, and when you output a, that in the notebook, it's nicely formatted and readable. You can write uh, mathematical notation in notebooks, so this is a, so there are code blocks like this one, there are output blocks like this one, and then this block is um, a markdown block. So if you double click it, um, it becomes editable. And um, so this is a special um, format called markdown that's meant to be um, easy to write um, and then uh, easy to typeset. So there's, so for example, um, these, uh, you know, anything that you have in, uh, in between asterisks becomes italic. Um, anything that is in between uh, dollar signs get type, gets typeset with LaTeX, uh, so on and so forth. So um, uh, for this tutorial, uh, for, for this whole workshop, I should say, um, we're, we'll be working in, uh, in Jupyter Lab and we'll be uh, using um, the Docker containers that, uh, that have been put together. Um, but if you want to um, set up your own Python environment uh, on your laptop, you may want to, and you want it to be a bit more permanent, um, then there are a number of options uh, uh, for doing that. Um, for example, on uh, Linux, you can use apt-get. If you're on a Mac, um, I really like Mac ports, um, and, and so I use that. And then on, on any platform, including Windows, uh, you can use a number of pre-assembled Python runtime environments, the most popular of which is Anaconda, um, and then there's also Canopy. Canopy. Okay, any questions so far? All right, great. Um, okay, so here's more Python basics. 
Um, the uh, simplest function in Python is print. Um, so you pass print a string delimited by single quotes or double quotes, and it just echoes the output. So you can output a string literal like this. If you want to have double quotes in your string, then you've got to quote it with single quotes, and then you don't have to escape the double quotes. Similarly, if you want to have single quotes in your string, then you should use double quotes to delimit it. If you have a string that needs to con contain both double and single quotes, then one way that you can do that is that you can use the backslash to escape uh, characters that would other otherwise have, have syntactic meaning in Python. Uh, so this is an example of such a string. Uh, another option is that um, if, you, if you want to avoid having to escape um, single and double quotes entirely, and if you want to preserve new lines in a string, then you can use triple quotes or, or sorry, triple swing, single quotes or triple double quotes to, to preserve almost every type of character. If you want to, you can, you can pass several arguments to uh, the print function on, uh, on the command line. So in this example, um, I have, oh, there's a syntax error right there. Oh, no, no, that's not a syntax error. Never mind. Um, so in this example, I have, a, I have a string literal that I've assigned to a, a variable, and then I just pass both of these arguments, and they get printed together uh, with a space in between them. Um, now, uh, this is a, the first uh, instance that we've seen of a variable assignment in Python. Um, so the right-hand side is a, is a literal, and the left-hand side is a, is a name. And so we're, we're, we're telling Python that, we, that whenever we write person, we want it, that to point to this, uh, this string object, which, whose contents is Miranda. Um, so uh, one of the beautiful things about Python, one of the many beautiful th things about Python, is that a lot of operators do common sense things. So for example, um, to concatenate two strings, you just add them. If you want to repeat the same string several times, you just multiply it by an integer. A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. All right, so that takes us to numeric literals. So there are a number of different ways of writing numbers in Python. Um, so you can, of course, write integers in decimal notation or in hexadecimal notation. Um, you can write uh, floating point numbers. You can use scientific notation. Uh, and, uh, num and Python also has built-in support for complex uh, Boolean literals are kind of special. There is a uh, there is a true object and a false object, and these are built into the language. So, um, but uh, they can be converted to and from integers as well. Um, okay, another thing that we've uh, that we've another new feature that we've used here is that uh, we've put some comments into our code. So um, anything that appears after a hash sign um, is a comment and is ignored by the interpreter. Um, okay, so the arithmetic uh, operators in Python are all similar to C, C++, Java, and so forth. So if you've used any of those other languages before, they'll be pretty familiar. So you have addition, multiplication, um, uh, division. Now, um, if you come from C or C++, you'll notice that even though um, uh, that, that if I divide two integers, I get a floating point number. So this is a change from, from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, but, uh, but basically, what you, what you have to remember is that uh, division of integers gives you floats. So it does real division. Um, if you want to have integer division, uh, so if you want the answer to be the floor of the quotient of the two numbers, then you use the double slash operator, like this. There's the percent operator, which is the signed, which is the remainder operator. So 32 mod 26, 26 is six. Exponentiation with the uh, double asterisk, um, and then uh, aside from uh, bit shift operators, um, that's about it. All right. Uh, now onto some data structures. Um, so in Python, uh, uh, the the um, the simplest a uh, data structure is called a tuple. A tuple is a sequence of values. Um, 
uh, it's the best thing since integers. Um, uh, a tuple is immutable, so that means once it's created, it cannot be modified. Um, so that can sometimes be useful. It can sometimes be a nuisance. Um, so once you've created a tuple, you can't add items to it or remove items to, from it or change items. Um, so they're very handy for, shorting, for storing short sequences of, of values, uh, whether or not those values are of, of uniform types. Um, so for instance, you could have a tuple of several strings. You could have a tuple of strings and floats. You could have a string, you, have a tu you could have a tuple of integers, strings, and even other tuples inside it. Um, indexing is accomplished with, the, with square brackets. Uh, indexes start from zero. So um, uh, for example here, some tuple is defined as A, B, C. So some tuple zero is A, and some tuple one is B. Um, uh, there's a convenient uh, notation called slice notation where you can get a range of values from a tuple um, by, by putting in square brackets the index that you want to start from, a colon, and one plus the integer, or, or one plus the index where you want it to end. Um, you can also count backward from the end of a tuple. So, um, for example, another tuple here is uh, defined like this. So another tuple bracket minus one would be the last element of the tuple. And another tuple bracket minus two would be the second to last element of the tuple. Um, strings behave just like tuples of characters. So strings, like tuples, are immutable. You can't edit them or, or um, change individual elements. Um, once you've created them, um, but you can index them just the same way. All right, lists. So uh, lists work a lot like tuples, except that you except that they are mutable, so you can change them after they've been created. Um, the syntax looks very similar, except that instead of um, using round brackets (parentheses) to create a tuple you use square brackets to create a list. Uh, uh, other than that, they can contain strings, integers, other lists, even tuples. Um, uh, how, however, here, here's a, you know, here I demonstrate that you can, uh, if you, you can assign to elements of a tuple, or sorry, elements of a list to change the list. You can append to it, and you can even delete elements from a list. Any questions about tuples and lists? Next, we have sets. So sometimes you want to have a collection of items and you don't care about the order. Um, so that data set is called a set. And again, the syntax looks a lot like lists or tuples, except that you create them with curly braces. Um, like tuples and lists, they don't care if you mix different data types. You can add items to a set, just like you, you can append items to a list, and you can take them away. However, sets add a number of additional operators that uh, tuples and lists don't have, so you can do set theoretic operations. Um, so for example, you can take the inter intersection of two lists with the ampersand operator. So uh, the set of elements that are in this and also in this are, is this. You can take the union with the vertical bar operator, and you can take the set difference uh, with the subtraction operator. Our last uh, data structure is the dictionary. Um, so sometimes you want something that's kind of like a list, except that instead of indexing the elements with an integer, you might want to index it with a string. So you give a name to each element, and that's a dictionary. Um, so a dictionary sort of behaves like a miniature database inside your Python program. Um, and again, the syntax is pretty similar to lists, tuples, and sets, um, except that uh, for each item, you have a key, um, that's its index, a colon, and then its value. So otherwise, they're, they're, they're very similar. So you can mix different data types. So in this dictionary, I have 
a string, uh, a float, a tuple, um, and there's another float off the screen. Um, uh, in, in all of these, the examples in here, the keys are all strings, although the key can be any immutable data type. So for instance, you can use integers or floats if you wanted to uh, as keys. Um, you index them using square brackets, just like you do with tuples and lists. You, add, you can add items to them simply by assigning to a key that doesn't yet exist. And you can delete items to them using the del statement. Um, so, like I said, uh, dictionary keys can be any immutable type of Python object. So, immutable Python objects include tuples, strings, integers, and floats. Um, and uh, so, in this example, I do have one element whose key is a tuple. Um, the, right, the, the values can be any Python object, immutable or immutable. Any questions about dictionaries? Go ahead. Oh, this is a set. Yep, yep. So, if you so so yeah, that's that, that's a that that can be a, a one confusing point of Python syntax that uh, a bunch of things in curly brackets can be a list, but if they but if there are colons in there as well, then it's a dictionary. Go ahead. Um, sets are you, you can use you use sets when you want. Um, the elements to be unique. So, um, if you want to, um, if if you want to check to see if a value is in some collection, let's say you have a list of um, uh, the names of Messier objects, and you have and you want to and you want to check if M eighty one is in that list or is, it, is in that collection. It's more efficient to store those names in a set because they don't you, you don't necessarily care about the order, but you do care about membership. That's right. I mean, you can, you can create a set with duplicate elements, but Python will, will only store the unique elements. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually, in Python 3, the idea that dictionaries and sets don't have an order, that's kind of a lie. They, dictionaries and sets do remember the order in which you added objects, um, but that's sort of an implementation detail. Um, and you can't index them with integers. Go ahead. Mapping sets. Yeah, well, that, that's a dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. So a dictionary is a one-to-one -one mapping of keys to values, but it doesn't give you a bijection back from values to keys. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, that's a. There's no. There's no um, fundamental data structure in Python to do that. But you could represent a bijection between two sets as a set of tuples. So each tuple is. So so if you, if you want to if you if you have two sets of in, of integers, then you you can have tuples that have element from set one, element of set two, and you can have a set of those. And that would that would accomplish what you're describing. Uh, go ahead. It's practically unlimited, L limited only by your computer's memory. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. So 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 sets and dictionaries do really efficient lookup. So like when you, so so if you um, if if you're concerned about you know adding whether adding lots and lots of elements to a dictionary will make it slower to look things up, it really won't. It, it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't check through every element in the dictionary. It does sort of a, it, 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 does a, it looks it up in a hash table, so it's fast. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, okay. Um, so there is, um, it isn't really a data structure, but it is a, an, a, a, an object that, that's built into the language. Um, so the, uh, the none object you can you can use to represent the lack of any value, so it's kind of like null or um, uh, you know. So um, so if you, you, you if if you have a, a data set that has missing values, you you might use none, or you might use it to represent um, uh, default behavior. Um, so you might be tempted to use some 
special number like minus one or 99 to represent missing uh, data, but it's much better to use uh, none because none is a value that no integer can have. Um, so now we've gone through all of the data structure, data structures that are built into Python, all of the uh, fundamental types, and now we'll talk about some con some uh, control flow. Um, so, uh, so the, our first uh, uh, control uh, flow statement is uh, is the conditional. So a conditional is um, uh, allows you to uh, switch between uh, different paths through your code um, according to the uh, result of an expression. Um, so, uh, so the the structure is that you have uh, you have you say if, and then you write some uh, conditional expression, and in, in this case, an in, in inequality. And if that inequality evaluates to true, then this block of code is evaluated. Um, you can have a series of many different conditionals, and all of the subsequent uh, conditionals will have and will will uh, will start with L if, which stands for else if, um, and it'll try to evaluate this. If it's false, then it'll try to evaluate this. If that's false, then it will fall back on the else block. Um, uh, so that's conditionals. Questions about conditionals? Go ahead. Oh, right. So um, okay. So this is this is uh, this comes from the C language. Um, so a single equal sign is assignment. So that that assigns a value to a variable. Double equals tests for equality. Um, now in some now in other languages that uh, Python drew inspiration from. A common error is uh, using a single equal sign in a conditional expression um, and doing assignment when you mean to test for equality. Uh, in Python, that'll actually be uh, a syntax error. So it's one fewer way to shoot yourself in the foot. Go ahead. Absolutely, yes. And, and so two, two tuples are equal if all of their elements are equal. Yeah. That's right. And for a dictionary, the order doesn't matter. Yeah, for for lists, however, it does matter. And actually, you can have two lists that are. No, I take that back. I, sorry, scratch that. Yeah, two lists are equal if their elements are equal. Yeah. Um, uh, another cool feature is that you can chain together inequalities just like you can in mathematical notation. So if you want to test if a is greater than zero and also less than or equal to five, um, then you can write if zero less than a less than or equal to five. Um, you can also combine uh, comparison operators use, uh, uh, using uh, and, or, and not. Um, and they're just words, so it's uh, more readable than in like C or C++ or Java. So here I'm testing if a is less than six or, or a is greater than a. Um, uh, you can uh, combine. You can you can have uh, more complicated uh, uh, mathematical expressions that appear in a conditional. So, for example, here I have I'm I'm testing whether whether a is less than six or if uh, the remainder of of a and two is a certain value. If you want to check if a condition is not true, you can you say if not condition. And this is, uh, this is the same as saying, as using the not equals operator, which is uh, exclamation point equals. Um, uh, finally, there's, uh, there's uh, another comparison operator called is that tests whether two Python objects are the same object. Um, so this is particularly useful um, for detecting whether a value is none because there's only one none object. Um, so, uh, so the way you use it, you say if something is something. So if food is none, then you do this, else something else. Similarly, you have is not. Um, okay, so here's some uh, set operators, or comparison operators. So you have in and not in. So you can test if a particular value is in a set, 
or a list or a tuple for that matter, um, or not in uh, a, a set or a list or a tuple, or in this case, a string. Um, when you have a dictionary, the in and not in operators actually test whether a, uh, whether a um, value is a key of that dictionary. Okay, any questions about uh, conditional expressions or Boolean expressions? Oh, that's uh, remainder. Our next control structure, or, or our next control flow statement is uh, loops. So there are two types of loops in Python, the for loop and the while loop. Um, so uh, the syntax of a for loop is you have uh, for the name of some variable, in then some collection of values, um, and that can be a string, a tuple, a list, a dictionary, a set, whatever you like, um, colon, and then a bunch of statements that are indented. Um, so this is the, oh, right. I should, have, I should have pointed out in the conditional section that in Python, um, to group together statements um, inside um, a, an if block or a for block or a while block, you indent them uh, with spaces. Um, so, um, so here, I'm looping over the list 0, 1, 2, 3, and executing the body of this loop for each statement. There's a built-in function called range, which returns a list of numbers. Um, so sometimes you want to uh, loop over all the integers in, in some range. So that's, uh, that's a shortcut for doing that. Um, you can have the range start from some value other than 0. If you want to loop over the, um, a dictionary, then you might use uh, dictionary.items, which loop loops over the keys and values of the dictionary. Okay. Um, lastly, we have the while loop. Um, and a while loop um, uh, iterates until a condition no longer evaluates to true. Okay. Any questions on loops? Go ahead. Zero, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. And the reason, the reason that is, the reason it doesn't include the last element is that when you write range four, Python thinks that you mean the, I, I want a list of integers of length four counting up from zero. Yeah, so it's, it's the zero based indexing coming back. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yes, yes. That, so that's a great question. Um, uh, let, so yeah, that's, that's enumerate. So I'll show how that works. So actually, no, I'll start a new cell. OK, so I just looped over the word hello, and I print the letters. But if I enumer enumerate over it, then enumerating gives me both the integer, you know, where I am in the loop, and then the value. Um, uh, you can even use that with dictionary.items, um, and that looks like this. What happened to D? D is not defined. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know why D is not defined, but yeah. Yeah, but, oh, it's because I haven't run this notebook. Yeah, yeah, okay. But it'll work on your computers. Uh, any other questions about loops? Go ahead, yeah. Oh, yeah, so uh, while A is less than five, A equals A times two. So, so I'm not, so, so a for loop, um, feeds you the elements of a collection one by one. However, a while loop runs a block of code until a condition is false. So here the condition if, is if A is less than five. Okay, so the first time that I come into this, so, so I start out with A equal to one. The first time I, I hit this line, uh, one is less than five, so this code is executed. So a equals a times two, so a becomes two, I print that. 
then I go back to the top. Two is still less than five, so I go through this loop again. So I so uh, a equals a times two. A becomes four, and I go back to the top. And then a equals a times two, eight. I go back to the top, and the condition is now false. Go ahead. In many cases, you can achieve the same thing with a for loop. Um, if you if um, if you have a collection of elements, then it's it's simplest to use a for loop. However, if you're um, one reason you might want to use a while loop is if you're getting data from some outside source. So you might be um, looping over input from the keyboard, or you might be looping over uh, a list of files, or or um, you, you you might be um, you know talking to a telescope control system. Those are those are all examples where you might where where you might want to reevaluate the condition every single time, or if you're if you're um, implementing an a a, a um, an iterative uh, algorithm such as you know evaluating the Fibonacci sequence up to a certain value, and you don't know what and and so the termination condition is a non-trivial function of you know the values that you're manipulating. Okay, any other questions about loops? Go ahead. No, you you can you can have. So if I set a to ten, nothing happens. Um, if I there's nothing syntactically that requires you to initial to initialize something before a for loop happens. So if I so for an example, if I want to just do the same thing over and over again, I can just say while true. But and and that seems that seems silly, but that may be something that is actually called for in your program if it's never supposed to terminate. You know. If it's doing something in real time, yeah. Uh, any other questions about loops? Uh, no, there are lots of reasons that you wouldn't want to enumerate. I mean, if you care about the elements in a set but not how many elements there are, you wouldn't need to use enumerate. I I use it fairly rarely. I'd I'd have to say. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, a nested loop. I don't have any examples of a nested loop here, but but it's it's um. It, 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 it's, um, let's see, so I could do um, for i in range 3, for j in range 4, using NumPy, which we'll get to. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Treya. No, I didn't, but I, I'll do that. Um, okay, so there are two parts of, there, there are two other um, handy things that you can do with loops. Um, there's break and continue. Um, so continue allows you to skip the rest of an iteration of a loop. Um, so for example, so I have a pretty basic, oops, basic loop here that prints the letters in hello, okay? Um, but let's say that I want to skip everything else that's happening in, in, in a loop. If, if a certain condition is true, I would use continue. So, if for, so for example, let's say I really don't like the letter L, okay? I don't, want to, I don't want to ever print the letter L. So I could say if letter equals L, continue. And so what that does, is continue says go back to the top of the loop and go through the next iteration. Skip anything else that's left in the body of the loop. Make sense? Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, now there's also break. Uh, let's say that I really love the letter L, but I don't want to see, but and I love it so much that I don't want to see any letters that come after the letter L. So I'd put a break. And a break says stop the loop immediately. Any other questions? All right, good. All right, uh, so we did conditional. Oh, conditional expressions are cool. Um, so, uh, so we did conditionals. They're fun, but sometimes you want you have something that's so you you have a conditional that's so simple that you want to write it on just a single line, and so instead of writing if blah, then blah else blah, you can rearrange it like this. So. Um, you, you have a value if 
a condition is true, else some other value. So it's just shorthand for writing a conditional on a single line. Go ahead. Oh, we did. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So list comprehensions, similar idea. Um, so they're a shorthand for writing a whole if statement on a single line. So a list comprehension, uh, you write square brackets, and then you sort of, you rearrange the loop so that the body of the loop comes first, and then the for statement comes second. So it's sort of backwards from how you normally write a for loop. Um, so this, this also looks a lot like set builder notation in mathematics. Um, so, for, so in this example, the body of the loop is i times 10, and then I'm looping uh, for i in range 5. So this runs, this, uh, or it evaluates this expression for each iteration of the, of the loop, and it gives me back a list um, uh, of those elements, like so. You can even incorporate conditionals. So uh, let's say that I only want to include iterations for which some expression is true. Then I can tack on a conditional to the end of my list comprehension. Oh, and I, yeah, OK. List comprehensions are uh, allow you to write loops in a much shorter way. They can uh, make your code more compact but they can get confusing if you use too many of them. So use sparingly. Any questions about list comprehensions? Okay, great. And then we did conditional expressions. Functions. Um, so functions are a way to take a bunch of code and make it reusable. Uh, you create a function with the def statement. Uh, it looks, so you write def, the name of the function, and then a list of the arguments to your function. So in this example, I've created a function that just squares a number. Um, and the value that you get out of the function is um, you, you, you express by writing a return statement. Um, and then you call uh, a function um, uh, similar to how you define it. Um, if you want to return multiple values from a function, you can return a tuple. and um, Parentheses in a return statement are optional. So if you leave off the parentheses, then it puts them in for you. So for a, for in this example, I have a function that returns the square and the cube of a number, and then I call it, and I get a tuple. Um, if a function returns multiple values, you can also uh, unpack the, the values um, as you assign them. So in this example, um, I have a list of variables, and it has to have the same number of elements as the function has return values. Um, so, uh, and this is also similar to how you unpack uh, values in a for loop. If you pass a mutable value, such as a list, to a function, then that function can modify that value. So that's something to be careful of. Um, so for example, Here's a function that um, builds up the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and uh, the thing that you have to watch out for here is that I pass in this list, this function can modify that list. Not usually a problem because usually the thing, when you pass variables to a function, usually the variables that have values that are immutable, so they're integers or strings or floats, um, but if they're lists or dictionaries, you have to be careful. Uh, you can give a function's arguments default values. So you do that by writing an equal sign next to the um, variable in the uh, function definition. And if a function has a large number of default arguments, you can also uh, make your code sort of self-documenting um, by using those named arguments when you call the function. Any questions about functions? All right, good. OK, um, so now we get to some Python uh, infrastructure or community type of uh, stuff. So Python comes with a huge standard library that does a lot of, a lot of useful things right out of the box. Um, an example is uh, it comes with a math library, which has things like square root and the value of pi. 
Um, so the way that you use a library or module, as they're called in Python, is you have to import it first. first. Here's a list of some of the most useful parts of the Python standard library. And these are all hyperlinks, so if, you, so if you're looking at a copy of this notebook, you can click all of these and it'll, it'll take you straight to the documentation. Um, random is our random number generator. Pickle allows us to uh, read and write entire Python objects to disk. So it's very similar to how you can save entire variables and matrices in MATLAB. Um, SQLite 3 gives us um, SQL database access. Uh, OS gives us uh, operating system services like the ability to rename files. OS.path for manipulating uh, paths on the file system. Subprocess for launching external commands. Email for uh, you know, parsing and receiving and sending e email. PDB for debugging. Um, RE, regular expressions. HTTP, uh, built-in um, uh, HTTP, HTTP client and server. Um, actually, I'm sorry, this, this is opt parse, but that should be arg parse for building uh, nice command line inter interfaces. And um, uh, iter tools for uh, sophisticated looping constructs. Um, and multiprocessing for uh, parallel computing. Okay, error handling. So in Python, if something goes wrong, if an error occurs, then you get what's called an exception. An exception causes the code to stop wherever it is, and um, the code is resumed if the exception is caught. Um, so if, if you don't explicitly catch an exception, then it, it, um, it gives you an error message and sends you back to the Python prompt. Um, so here's an example. The, this is the sync function. It's just sign x over x. If you try to evaluate sync of zero, you get a zero division error exception. So we know that, and we want to catch that error and handle it correctly. Um, and so you do that using try except. So you put the code that you think might um, encounter an error in the try block, and then you and then you put the code to deal with the error in the accept block. Um, so in this case, if we encounter a zero division error, then the result is set to one. Reading and writing files. Um, so there's a built-in function called open, um, which uh, takes the name of a file as an argument and a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, else. Yeah, oh, act, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, So, so there's else, which is the, a block that is executed if no except statements are hit. So so the else block will be skipped if you hit any of the except statements. And then uh, there is a finally, which um, is always executed. So. Um, so we could just as easily put our return result line inside the finally block there. Oh, what did I do wrong? No, oh, math is not defined. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So finally, uh, so so right. So you can when you open a file, you need to tell it explicitly if you want to write to it. So you pass a mode argument, which can be R for reading or W for writing, um, and then you write to it, and then you close it. Um, and then here's reading. So you can use a you can use a, an open file um, as something that you can iterate over in a for loop. And when you do that, each iteration of the for loop gets a line from the file. Okay, so, so that's, that concludes the Python um, standard library. Any questions about that? Go ahead. You run the code and see how it breaks? Um, it's usually very unwise to do that. Um, there are, 
there are only a few instances where that really makes sense. And one instance is like if, if you're operating a, um, a defibrillator, if you're operating a piece of medical equipment and someone will die if you don't handle the exception, then it's okay to use a bare accept statement. But that's like almost the only reason. Or, well, okay, if, if, you're, if your telescope is going to go upside down and the instrument is going to fall off, then that, that might be another case where you can use a bare accept clause. Yeah. Um, Well-written documentation, like, like any, any function in the Python standard library will, sh should clearly state what exceptions it can raise. Yeah. Don't do that. Okay, any other questions? about standard library or error handling, anything else we've talked about so far? Oh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there, there, there are warnings too, which, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, that's a, that's a little too, too complicated. I'll come back to that if, if it comes up in the, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, the, the question is if there's a standard place to look for um, what all the different, you know, error messages are. And I think that would be in the, so I've gone to docs.python.org and I've gone to the Python standard library and there is a section called built-in exceptions. And um, this is a list of the most common types of exceptions. And if you're, so, so, any built-in Python function will raise one of these errors. If you're using a piece of the standard library that like, you know, for example, if you're using the HTTP module, then there are additional errors that are subclasses of these errors that it can raise. And those other exceptions are defined in that module. So NumPy and Matplotlib. Um, so Python has lots of different built-in data structures, uh, sets, lists, tuples, dictionaries, and strings, um, but what it doesn't have is a good built-in uh, vector or array type. Um, and so NumPy is a third-party package uh, that provides that. Um, so NumPy arrays uh, look a lot like lists, except that you declare them using numpy.asarray or numpy.array, array. and then you can, once you, do, once you have an array, then you can uh, perform arithmetic with it, and the arithmetic is repeated or broadcast over all of the elements of the array. You can have multi-dimensional arrays. Um, so in this example, I have a two by two, uh, sorry, a three by three, two-dimensional matrix, or array. And I can ask how many dimensions an array has. I can ask what are, what is the shape, what are the list of the dimensions of an array. And I, I can ask for the total number of elements, which is the size. Um, if you try to multiply by arrays, then by default, um, uh, it is, it, it's element-wise multiplication. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna execute some of these shells, or some of these, these um, cells. And if you want to perform matrix multiplication, you have to explicitly say that you want to do that. So you say numpy.asmatrix. Um, there's also the numpy dot dot function, which does inner products, and so that's the same thing for matrices. And as of Python 3, there is also the, help me, what's the, uh, at, yeah, it's the, uh, oops, sorry. There's a new operator, the at sign, which is actually a built-in function in Python. It doesn't do anything uh, in for built-in types, um, but, NumPy allows you to use the at sign as a shortcut for an inner product. Um, you can perform comparison on arrays. So again, comparisons are element-wise, like any other operation. You can't directly use a Boolean array as the value of an, as the um, conditional of an if statement. Um, but what you can do is you can say if any uh, element of a Boolean array is true or false. 
You can also use Boolean arrays as, express, as, uh, as indices. So for example, if I want to assign a particular value to every element in this, in this array that meets some condition, then I can put the condition in square brackets. Um, I can manipulate individual rows. So this, this is like um, slice notation, except that um, if I have a multi-dimensional array, then I separate the individual subscripts with commas. Oh, all right, okay. And, and there's also matplotlib for plotting, and this astropy material we can save for the next session because that'll be the first session where we actually use astropy. So stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, so do we have a so we have break. questions on material covered in this session? Uh, sorry, uh, um, that's a really good question. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I will look that up and I will get back to you after the break. Yeah, I use as array usually, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, argmax, yeah. The question is if you want to know the maximum of an array or you want to know the, um, the index of the maximum value, there's, there's numpy.max for the maximum value and numpy.argmax for the maximum index. And we'll actually be using that in the in next session. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, we will break here for tea and we will resume the next session in half an hour at 11 o'clock.